There's some cliches that we, we grew up with in church, some of which we have discovered to be a bit bogus, and some we have discovered to be true. Amen? One of those cliches growing up was they would tell us that Sunday service is for casual Christians, and then who, who said that before? And then midweek service is for serious Christians. Now, is that bogus or not? It's not the Bible, but is it? Is, is everything in the Bible? Is your wife's name? The Bible say, "Thou shalt marry Kephaya shepherds." Did you see that in the Bible? <laughs> you know, let me let me assure you of this. Um, and this might sound a, a wee bit arrogant, but like Paul says, whatever boast I have to make, I make in the Lord because I am nothing without Him. When he found me, I was nothing. If he ever, God forbid, left me, I would be nothing. Amen. So all my reality and all my my substance is found in him. So there's no there's no arrogance at all. Because every boast I have to make, I can make because of him. Um, there are people who get born again today and start ministry tomorrow. And sometimes it's godly. I was not one of them. Amen. Um, the 25th of February, 2000. And 14 will be my 14th year anniversary as a minister. Amen. It's been, it's been an interesting journey, to say the least. The reason I say this is, uh, Pastor, remember I preached, a, I preached a message at your conference earlier this year, and I said that God's, in God's mind, process is process. Uh, we can change our earthly titles, but we don't upgrade ourselves in God's process prematurely. For instance, if God called Pastor Shepherds and Pastor Jockey on the same day, and he intends that in 15 years on the day he called them, they would become, in quote, in his mind, in his mind, bishops. If Pastor Shepherds stays as brother, so I'll say bro, say bro with a dot, you know. Uh, growing up uh, in a country I came from, there were different levels of titles. There was there was bishop, there was pastor, there was reverend, there was deacon, true deaconess, then there was bra with a dot. You know that was that was a title on its own. So you'd see a flyer and it say bra. You know, so if Pastor Shepherd stayed as bra for fourteen years, and Pastor Jacket three years in decided to buy a bishopric. In the earth, she's bishop such and such. He's bra, right? But in the mind of God, does that make sense? Uh, there are pastors who pastor people who should be their pastors. I, 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 there's some pastors who have people sat down in their churches who are qualified, but nobody like that here, man. <laughs> just, just, but what I'm trying to make is, in God's mind, there is process that must... And process isn't time. Thank you, Pastor Paul. Thank you, thank you. Process isn't time. Process is obedience in time. Can I repeat myself? Process is not how long you have spent. Process is how long you have spent obeying consistently. Um, I say that to say this. By the time God said, I want you to start a church or plant a church. I hate the word start a church. It starts like, you know, you just write a business plan and, you know, just start a church. I had been, how long now? Ministering for 14 years, full-time ministry for eight years. Started EKC just over four years, about four years ago. So that had been 10 years of ministry and... <laughs> Longer than that, as a Christian, I had seen what had worked. I had seen what hadn't worked. I had figured out what was bogus, at least to a degree, because I'm still learning. Figured out what was authentic. And I had challenged every single thing about conventional church methods that I could find to challenge. I'm saying that to say this. There could be the odd 1% where we are still learning and growing, but 99% of the time... If we do something in this house, it's not because it's been done for centuries. It's been the product of being challenged and we have discovered that this is an authentic blueprint or part of the blueprint of God's kingdom. For instance, why do we have midweek services? 
Why can't we just come once on a Sunday and jump and dance and go home? Because the Bible says clearly, why do we have life groups? You can lift it straight from scripture. They met daily. Someone say daily. daily. Say daily. daily. You complain about twice a week. They met daily. <laughs> Bible says in the temple, Solomon's porch, and in houses. Someone say in the temple. In the temple. Say in houses. in houses. They met in the temple. That will be our Sunday meeting. But if you look to the book of the Acts of Apostles, most of the most of the significant outpourings of God's Spirit didn't happen at the temple. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. What happened at the temple? If you're a temple Christian, you're you're working with thirty-five, maximum forty percent of everything God has for you. Besides, there are. Things that cannot be explained. This is one thing you got to understand. Um, I know there's preachers who want to demonstrate how anointed and gifted they are. I'm not one of them. I'm very secure. Someone says he's very secure. I don't need your approval, amen. It's nice. Don't get me wrong. It's beautiful to say, oh, wonderful message. But, but I don't lose any sleep because you frown at me, amen. I know I'm called, amen. I don't preach anything I wasn't sent to preach, amen. So I'm very secure in myself. But I know there's people who like to theoretize and revelate and postulate just for applause and wow, that sounds deep. But when you've been in this thing as long as I've been, you realize that it is, it is foolish to cast precious pearl before swine. And I'm not calling anybody a pig. No, it's a metaphor. The Bible is saying you don't give something to a person who either will not appreciate it or cannot by virtue of maturity appreciate it. Amen. I will not buy Kadesh a gold Rolex. No matter how rich I was, he would not, he put in his mouth. Amen. Like almost every other thing he finds his hands on. So I wouldn't give him a Rolex, a gold Rolex. I mean, he has his own, he has his own tablet, you know, has his cute little tablet and his cute little smartphone. Amen. Amen. It should then cost somewhere between 10 and 30 pounds maximum, let's say 10 pounds or so. I will not give him at his age my iPad. No. Because he will not appreciate it. He will not know how to use it. It will not be valuable to him and he will end up abusing it. Amen. The same thing happens in the realm of the spirit. There are things God, Jesus told his disciples, there's things I want to say to you. There's things I want to release to you. But you cannot yet bear them. Now see, the word bear means you don't have the capacity to survive under the weight of them. Let me, let me break that down for a second. See, whenever God releases a dimension of his presence, I mean, we all understand that the glory of God talks about his nature. But the Bible also says in the beginning was the word, the word was a God and the word was God. So even his word is himself. The Bible says we have these great and precious promises, meaning the word, by which we can be partakers of a divine nature. Whenever God speaks something, he is releasing a piece of himself in language to open a portal for you to step into the same dimension of him that he spoke. Are you with me? Can I repeat myself? When God says something, he's not just communicating information. He's not just making a promise or, or a statement. He has opened a doorway. Someone say doorway. That's why you should write. Because he has opened a doorway for you to walk into the same level or dimension of himself as what he spoke. So when God talks to you about healing, he's not just telling you how it works. He's opening a portal for you to walk either into healing for yourself or into an anointing for healing to minister to others. Are you with me? Amen. Now, God is weighty. Someone say weighty. God say, no, look at me. Say God's a big boy. Don't, don't, he, he won't be offended, don't worry. Just tell them. Tell, say God's a big boy. Tell your neighbors. What are you thinking? Oh, Lord, that's very, very, you know, disrespectful. No, 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 no. I, I'll explain myself. God's a big boy. God, God is weighty. Someone say weighty. He's weighty, he's weighty. And so when he releases his glory and he releases his revelation, it has weight. Amen. Oh, yes. uh, I started going to the gym. I know I don't look it, but relax. Give me, a, give me a little while. I'll get there. I started going to the gym regularly for the first time in almost four years recently. You know, I, you know New Year resolution, first day of the year, paid for my gym membership. I've been going. My wife will tell you. Amen. Amen. Right, ma'am? I've been going, I've been going. Amen. I've been going. Amen. Someone say he's been going. 
he's been going, he's been going. And I went on the first day, you know, with my, like someone once said, my prosperity belly, you know. And uh, I dug up my gym bag, and lo and behold, by the time I got to the gym, the only top I saw was the one I used to use when I had a six-pack. You know those ones that, 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 that are like almost skin tight? The ones that actually mold your body. You know, so there I was in the weight section. And then I don't want to mention his name, but I saw someone that I know in the gym, you know, and he was looking all buff and I was trying to hide. He said, ah, oh, pastor, Lord, Lord. I said, okay, yeah, yeah, ah, oh, pastor, you're here, okay. He, then he took me to the, to the bench press. He said, let me spot you. I thought, oh. I said, okay. So he put 50 kg and I was like, you know, I was like, you know, uh, uh, just, just help me, you know. I, I was pretending like, you know, I, I, he just figured. So he just, he didn't say anything. He just took off the 50 kg and put 25 on either side. I was like, okay, I was like, God bless you. <laughs> you know, and, and there I was, you know, I, I one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And I, I, I learned a valuable lesson. Weight can either make you weighty or crush you. Are you with me? You, weight can increase your strength. There is something about resistance that makes you strong. And sometimes that's why God allows you to go through certain things because the weight of the thing, if it is calculated, if it is, if it is constructively calculated, will make you stronger, increase your capacity. But if it is not properly calculated, it will destroy you. I went home that day with my rotator cuff almost torn. And you don't know what I'm talking about. It's a little, you know, part of your shoulder. And I, 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 I couldn't sleep on it. And, and thank God I, I replaced the 50 aside with 25 aside because, because if I had that 50 aside and I did 10 times trying to pretend that I was who I was not, I'd have probably been in a sling by now. When you release levels of God in revelation and impartation that an individual or people are not ready to handle, the Bible says they cannot bear it. It's not just that it is useless to them. It can destroy them. And God, the Bible says, his eyes are going to and fro the earth. He's looking for someone whose heart is perfect to him. He can show himself strong. God is eager to release. Don't say God is eager to release. You know, I, I stopped praying all this, you know, Lord, send revival, and I don't pray that nonsense again. And not for the reason some people, some people say, oh, you know, you don't have to pray because it's already been done. No, no, no. Healing's already been done, but we pray for it, amen. Daily bread's already been done, but we pray for it, amen. It's not, it, there's nothing wrong with praying for something God's already done, as long as you're praying in the faith that he's already done it. But the reason why I've stopped praying for revival is, it's like, it's like telling, it's like my son telling me, you know, uh, uh, you know, daddy, buy me a car. No, bad analogy. Let me let, 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 let me try. Let me give you a better analogy. I, okay, I don't know what analogy to give, but let me just say this in black and white. God is eager, willing, anxious, uh, 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 impatient to pour out certain levels of Himself. We don't need to ask Him to do it. Did you hear that? Can I repeat myself? I said God is. On a leash, straining to release. The time we spend asking him to release, we would be better served spending it asking him to help us qualify for release. You know, and, 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 and that's why this, you know, next weekend, threshing floor, night of breakthrough, fourth anniversary, amen. amen. Who's excited? I am. I am, amen. I'll be around next week, amen. I promise. Amen, you know. Now that I'm not around, you guys miss me, you see. A prophet is always without honor. I'm just joking. One of the things I'm going to be dealing with that next weekend is about Gideon. But I want to give you a taste tonight. Can I can we do a little taste? Can we go to Judges 7? Judges 7. Judges 7. Now, while we're going there, 
Let me say this. One of the factors that determines how much of God a person or people can bear is the culture. Someone say culture. Or the climate. Say climate. Of the person or the people. Someone say culture. Say climate. Everybody has an ambient culture. Everybody has a subconscious climate. Does that make sense? Uh, culture. I, and I, I was writing something which I ended up not. I don't know if I put it on Facebook anymore or not. You know, because these days I don't. I don't know what I put and what I don't put. I told somebody I'm not. A, I'm not a Facebook prophet. I don't. Put, I don't put a status every day. You know, if you go to my wall every single day, you will be disappointed because some. When I put something, I expect you to spend two weeks digesting it. Amen. Does that make sense? So rather than put one little snippet every day, I'll put something that for two weeks you can digest. And I only ever type when I hear God say something to me. And there's some things that I start typing and I shake my head and I say, the world isn't ready to hear this. So I just delete it and I store it on my laptop. And maybe two years from now I can put it on Facebook. Because there's too many oohs and ahs and deep and yay and nothing is done about it nothing oh word people in church stand up preach sir i'm like you said that last year when i preached the same message you know i've learned just to repackage what's the point i preach i've learned to preach the same message five six times a year different title different scripture same point and the same people shout preach same people hear, mm. same people go ah same facial expression, same spot, same chair. <laughs> oh, Lord, someone say help us. But I was writing something about organizational culture. I discovered that the biggest factor in fulfilling destiny, in fact, I did a study on the Bible and on history. And for those of you who think he hasn't opened the Bible yet, we'll get there. I'm just talking. It's a family meeting. Amen? Amen. I understand how to preach. I know you should read the text first. Then we'll all stand up and we'll read the word of God. Then we'll sit down. But bear with me. I discovered that talent. Someone say talent. Stroke gifting. Someone say gifting. And calling. Someone say calling. Are the two least important factors in fulfilling destiny. Whether of a person of a people people could be church country family whatever for those of us who, who here has done any kind of management training course or whatever management mba and of that nature you know leadership some of that okay there's two things two motivational or two aspects of motivation you learn about there are hygiene factors who's heard the term before and then there are motivational factors now a hygiene factor it's not about how clean the place is. It just means if this thing is not in place, people won't perform. But it doesn't necessarily, more of it doesn't necessarily make you perform better. So it's a prerequisite, but it doesn't increase performance. And a motivational factor is something that, you know, you can survive without... A little bit, but it will weigh. In. Does that make sense? So, for instance, they teach that money is a hygiene factor. Would you be? Would you? Would you believe that? That in today's in today's in the in the Western world today, unbelievers don't pick jobs just because of money, but Christians do. But moving on, unbelievers will leave up job paying three hundred grand a year to take one paying thirty a year, so they can be closer to their families. Footballers will leave a club paying them 200000 a week to move back to a third world country to one paying them 30000 a week so that their wife can be happy. Unbelievers have that wisdom. Christians don't. Mercy. The same way, talent, anointing, calling is a hygiene factor. If you're not called, you, you can't fulfill a destiny you're not called to anyway. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> you know, you just run in someone else's lane, you know. You know, I see, 
I know people don't like these men, you know, and for some reasons or the other, you go on YouTube, you see things about them, you open Facebook, you hear people attack them. You know, I just go by what I experienced directly, man. You know, uh, so much furore recently about Bishop David Oedipo and a, and a YouTube video, which, frankly speaking, I'm not, neither here nor there about. You know, but I've been listening to this man for, for eons now, for almost 20 years, and I heard he, he preached a message in about 2003 that just... I'll never forget the analogy he gave. He was talking about running in your own lane. He said, imagine now, this is how I talk, say, imagine now, the finals of the Olympic Games. You know, everybody's about to start and, and this man who's not in the race comes there, forms his own lane. <laughs> and they shoot the gun, they're all running. Says his wife is shouting. <laughs> his children are clapping. <laughs> he gets there first. As he goes first, they tell him, stand aside, you're not included. I can't just rock up to the Olympic Games and, you know, form my lane beside Bolt and Powell and Gay and Gatlin. And even if I beat them, when I get to the line, I want to say stand aside. Amen. It's not a race you were registered in. Yes. Yes. Right. And many Christians need to understand. Ah. Hallelujah. I was sharing with a friend of mine yesterday who, you know, well, he doesn't pastor a church, but he's been in ministry for a little while under people in different ministries. And I said, the... the the deepest thing God did for me in the last 18 months through all my trials and tribulations and attacks and pains was to establish what and who he called me to be what and who to and not. I beat myself. To establish what and who he called me to be what and who to and not. I'm called to be husband to Ajaka Israel is Yahweh. Amen. I am not called to be husband to everybody else in this room. Amen. I am not called to be husband to Ecclesia Kingdom Center. Amen. That's Christ's bride. Amen. 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 Does that make sense? Yep. I'm called to be pastor. There's a balance. There's a difference. Yes. If I try and be husband to a church, I'll end up on a cross like the church's husband. Yep. I should know I've been there. Anybody who wants to marry the church should be prepared to be crucified between two thieves. Amen. Oh, wow. Can I repeat myself? If you attempt to marry the bride of Christ, I can guarantee you, you will end up on a cross. Not between two thieves. Like a certain preacher said, boo-boo and ray, ray. <laughs> And one of them will tell you if you be the son of God. Amen. I have grace to marry one person. Amen. What are the marital vows? Till death do us part. There's only one person on the surface of the earth mm -hmm. that I said that to. Yep. You don't get where I'm going. So there are some people in your life. Don't wait till death does you part. Because if you do... Oh, Can I repeat myself? If you wait, if you don't do something, it will take, death will come to you. And then it will do you part. You will kill yourself. You notice that nowhere in the Bible does it say you should tell your biological children to death do you part. Hello. Come on now. Oh, you're not getting this, are you? I'm, I'm. Okay, let, let's move on. Let's move on. You get, you get me. You get me. You have no choice. You get me eventually. I am called to be in a lifetime unrevocable, unsuspendable, unadjustable relationship with one individual. Amen. And see my hairline. And like I keep jokingly telling her, there's a picture of me the year I met her. I had an afro. Amen. I'm just joking. <laughs> now, one human being wants to marry 20, 30, 500, 1,000, 25,000 people. You die. Mm -hmm. It's not your lane. Come on. Amen. Yeah. It's not your lane. Oh, yes. It's not your assignment. I am not called to be the Holy Spirit. Oh. Amen. 
The Holy Spirit might use me to call you once or twice when you're going wrong and say, what are you doing? But if that now means for the rest of your walk with God, you keep saying, well, you know what? When, 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 when P.O. calls me, uh, you, you just keep walking. Amen. Uh, how many people can God talk to me about in the shower every day? Come on now. <laughs> Not the Holy Spirit. And something that delivered me, I was telling, I was telling this friend of mine, like, wow, wow, wow. Imagine having 500 biological children. Hello. Imagine having 500 biological children. There's a difference between a spiritual child and a biological child. There's a difference. There's a difference. There's a difference. There's a difference. There is a difference. Someone say difference. Difference. It's not your lane. It's not your lane. Someone say lane. It's not my lane to raise 500 people Amen. like I was there. F- no. Mm. Hello. Amen. Yes, sir. <laughs> so say calling. calling. Say anointing. anointing. Don't do something you weren't anointed to do. I'm not anointed to play the drums. Not yet, anyway. Amen. Amen. Someone say it's not my anointing. It's not my anointing. Now, I can spend my time learning to do something I was not anointed to do. And I'd get reasonably good at it. But I could spend a third of that same time learning to do what I was anointed to do. And be twice as good at it in a third of the time. Right. Right. Let me give you an analogy. 10, 13, 14, 15 years ago when it first came out, there was a game called, then it was called Championship Manager that I fell in love with as a young man. Nowadays, my wife will tell you at least once a year for about four to six weeks, I go through a phase where I just buy the latest one. I play it for like four to six weeks and I get tired of it and I dump it for the next year. It's my way of de-stressing, amen. Uh, it's a football manager game where you're supposed to be a coach and you buy players. You know, you just it's a game on a PC or Mac. You act like a coach. And, and I just like it because it's realistic. It teaches me certain things, which my wife argues about. But I, I think it benefits my IQ. And after about six weeks, usually I get fed up with it and I dump it and I, I move on. till the next one comes the next year, then I do it again. Now, I discovered something. Um, I'll give you an example. Now, in the game... Because it's a game, so you can't see the physical players. You're given a screen with attributes on them to tell you about the player. So, for instance, crossing, 18 over 20. Passing, 17 over 20. Heading, 2 over 20. So, this guy can't head. And I discovered that every single position on a football field has certain attributes that are useful and some that are not useful. Amen. Amen. And you are allowed to train a player, train per se, to try and get better in a certain kind of attribute. And I learned two things. Some players are naturally inclined a certain way. I could spend six weeks training her to head and six weeks training him to head. His heading rating will increase by five. Hers will increase by half. Amen. Amen. And vice versa. So you, you, you study the makeup of the player mm-hmm. to understand how to train him. Yeah. So you don't waste valuable time and development yeah. making him marginally better in something he was never gifted to be. But even more importantly, I learned different positions have different parts or different attributes that are necessary. I don't need to train Lionel Messi how to jump and catch. He's not a goalkeeper. Mm-hmm. Hallelujah. Amen. And you could see a guy who has zero in handling, five in tackling, over 20, three in marking, having 90% overall because he's a striker. He doesn't need to mark, doesn't need to tackle, doesn't need to catch. And you see guys who have 14 everywhere, overall 70. Because being a jack of all trades, does that make sense? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? You see, one player who everything is between 12 and 14, 12 and 14 across the board. Overall, he's a 60. Another player has a zero here, a five there, a three there, but a 19 there, a 20 there, an 18 there. 
And that one with 0, 2, 19, and 20 is 90. Someone say lane. lane. Say anointing. anointing. But these are just hygiene factors. Without them, you're not going anywhere, but they don't determine squat. Does that make sense? In other words, a guy who has five talents and a guy who has two talents can end up with the same commendation from God. Read your Bible. Amen. That's right. Thou good and faithful. Five talents, two talents. Amen. Same reward. Mm. Yeah. Are you with me? Oh, yes. Because talents, giftings, don't count. Or, well, when I say don't count, don't determine who fulfills destiny. Mm. So what determines who fulfills destiny? Let me give you the top two. Someone say relationship. Relationship. I'll talk about that next week if we'll give me grace. I discovered that who you are around sometimes is more important than who you are. Yes. Can I go there quickly? Do you believe me? Because I'll, I'll, I'll give you scriptures to back it up. But do you believe me before I give you the scriptures? That who you are around, who you are connected to, Upwards, sideways, and downwards is more important. In other words, your nurture is more important than your nature. The Bible says Lot prospered because he was around Abraham. There is no record in scripture of Joshua having a burning bush experience. He tagged along with Moses. And the Bible says Moses would encounter God. Moses would get tired and go and sleep. Joshua would say, pause. He couldn't provoke his own manifestation of God. He did not know how to invoke his own presence. But when Moses invoked it and left, he said, God, would you stay, please? And the Bible says he would tarry. Someone say tarry. The Bible is full of people. Who by association. Samuel with all his gifting. All his anointing. All his calling. Heard the voice of God three times. And assumed somebody was talking to him. And a backslidden prophet. Who was about to fall and break his neck. Said that's God. Oh. Amen. Next time he speaks. Say this. Amen. And Samuel went and applied. The instruction of a backslidden priest. And began his prophetic ministry. The Bible says he ministered to the Lord before Eli. Are you with me? Yes, sir. Can go on and on and on. The Bible says Peter, John, and the disciples, when the, when the Pharisees arrested them, they said they took notice that they had been with Jesus. Not that they were anointed. No, no. Not, oh, come on. It's, it called them illiterate. It called them unlearned people. But it said that they took notice that they had been with Jesus. It works the other way. Moses was the anointed one. Aaron was the mouthpiece. Are you with me? Paul says... Timothy, my son, there's no other like him who has my mind and my heart. And you read the epistles. You, I mean, you know, Timothy wrote some of those epistles. Paul dictated them. Timothy wrote them. Are you with me? Are you with me? Moses, as gifted as he was, God said, when it's time to build a tabernacle, I'll give you the blueprint. But I'll send you two people, Bezalel, are you with me? And Holyab. He says, I have put in them the gifting and the skill to make what I have shown you. Moses would have died. Mm. Leaders need to understand this. Many leaders die frustrated because the ability to produce what they see resides in someone else. And if you never find that person or if you allow Satan drive a wedge because of your arrogance and pride and I am the one who is in charge. You die. You die. Every good songwriter knows your song's only as good as the producer. Every good singer knows you're only as good as, your, as the person playing the keyboard. No matter how anointed, no matter how much I prayed, 
If I'm trying to sing a do and Pastor Paul's playing a T or T, it won't work. That's why sometimes you see us. Because I'm seeing something. I saw a tabernacle in the spirit. But the skill to extract Amen. the manifestation Amen. lies in somebody else's fingers. Yep. Are you with me? There are people God has placed around you who are more important to your destiny than your so-called anointing. And that's why, if you notice, Pastor Sam, most of the people who fulfill, who become excellent, the Bible says God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. It says not many, not many wise are called, not many strong, not many perfect, but God has used the foolish things because the people who have the most gifted natural resources usually are the most bankrupt in their ability to connect with people around them. They're arrogant, they're proud, they're self-centered, they don't listen, they don't take advice, don't take instruction, they mistreat those beneath them, they, treat, so they, they just destroy all the avenues. Right. The people who are supposed to... See, 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 let me say this to you. Everybody has an introducer, everybody has a door opener. And I, 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 was, I was talking to my dear friend, Dr. Alex, recently, and they said, Pastor Lumine, there's a saying in Zambia, you know, Pastor Alex from Zambia, so there's a saying in Zambia, I don't know if the Malawians and the Zimbabweans have it as well, that you don't desecrate a village on your way out. Because you don't know when you have to walk through that village to get somewhere else. Amen. Come on, can I repeat myself? You don't defecate, you don't meaning, you know, poo. <laughs> you don't, you know, because, because you are leaving a village for the city. Because you think God has opened, you don't desecrate the village on your way out because you never know when the chief of that village will. Yeah. Oh, yes. And there are people who have desecrated relationships, people who have broken. Not, not, see, see, the times where you move, I mean, everybody understands when you just move apart. There's friends, leaders, I mean, the time comes when you just grow apart. No beef, no issues, you know. Sometimes you fight for it and it dies and you walk away. But some people have, have destroyed or walked away from the channel of their destiny. Jesus. I mean, how much more cold than Jesus can you get? How much more anointed than him can you get? The Bible says, on him the spirit of God rests without measure. Hallelujah. Jesus walked to the river Jordan and told his cousin, six months older than him, that's all. So that, that's all, the cousins. And he said, see, see, let me give you a picture. John was a Levite. Jesus was a Judahite. John was from the tribe of Levi. Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. Are you with me? Are you with me? Levi was the priestly tribe. Marana Makaya. Levite was the old testament house are you with me of the priesthood judah was the old testament house of the kingship jesus's assignment was to marry priesthood and kingship in one he says you have something that by human right i don't you have to baptize me are you with me i'm from judah i have a right to rule as a king I don't have the right to practice as a priest Levitically as of now. If I am going to contact that anointing, someone who carries it. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. Someone who carries it has to release it to me. Yes. But if, I, I mean, if, if, if many of us were Jesus, do you know who I am? I mean, where, 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 when the angels were singing, Hark the Herald Angels sing, where were you? Were you the one that the star brought the men from the east for? Look at all the gold, frankincense, and made a, well, Come on, my friend. Relationships. And not just upwards, sideways and downwards. Sideways and downwards, sideways and downwards. For instance, who do you marry? Some people marry out of destiny. Yeah. Or marry into prolonged destiny. Yeah. Are you with me? And. I am talking specifically about those who knew God, who were Christians, born again, ignored him. The Bible says God wings at the days of disobedience. 
So days of ignorance, sorry. The, the mistakes you make when you, know, when you don't know better one thing, but many of us take decisions with our eyes wide shut. You know what I mean? But God, he found. Man, she's... God, you have to understand now. Ah, but this is not firewood. <laughs> people, uh, people pick churches based on color. I'm, I'm, I'm not joking, I'm telling you. You go to pastor training conferences and things you hear, I want to just slap someone. I, just want, at least really, at least, I want to slap them like they stole something. You go for pastor training conferences, you spend 70% of the time teaching the people how to build a church from a brand perspective. Then they now call someone like me to do the last session. And then they wonder why, you know, people have spent 48 hours, 48 hours hearing about how to pick your logo, what colors to use, what words to use during the offering, all these kind of things. Then they now bring me to close with the last session. I'm like, God. By the time the fire of God breaks to the plate, they can't remember anything they've learned. Good. Because they learned rubbish. Do these things work? Yes. Are they the foundation? No. Are you with me? But people, the reasons why these conferences exist are because they know people pick or make spiritual decisions stupidly. Why should you be part of a church because of spiritual genealogy? Can I repeat myself? What is the oil? And not just in terms of anointing, even in terms of emphasis. Every preacher, every minister, every prophet, every pastor has a spiritual DNA. Whose DNA do you need for your destiny? And sometimes it's not even the DNA of the set man. It's the DNA of someone in whose lineage the set man is. Yes. Are you with me? Because yes. genes can be dormant or recessive or active. Does that make sense? Amen. You can have a father who's tall with a son who's short with a grandson who's a giant. Amen. Are you with me? Yes. A father who's bald with a son with hair with a grandson who's bolder. Does that make sense? Yes. And God knows and not just the set man, even the, what's the culture of the house? What's the culture of the leadership, the culture of the people? Where is your destiny going to be sharpened and encouraged? And what atmosphere do you need to become all you can be? But some people know the parking lot looks nice. I like the pastor's Versace suit. Thank God I don't dress like a tramp, amen? I'm not knocking these things. Someone say relationships. relationships. But by far, someone say by far. That's number two. Relationship is number two. I guarantee you, check the Bible. There is, no, there is one person in scripture who showed up from nowhere who succeeded. His name is Melchizedek. It's the only person in scripture who showed up from nowhere who succeeded. Everybody else, watch their relationships. Look at Saul's relationships. Look at Solomon's relationships. Look at Samson's relationships. SSS. It'll tell you something. Amen? Amen. Study Saul, Samson, and Solomon. And study their relationships or lack thereof. And you'll discover how to fail. Mm -hmm. Flip it round and you discover how to succeed. Fair? But the most important thing is culture. Someone says culture. culture. Now what is culture? I mean you can define it many ways. But let me give you my definition for the context of what I'm trying to say. Culture is the... Huh, you know what? I, let, let, let me distill this. You can have a culture of language, a culture of tribe, a culture of an organization, a culture of a family. But culture is an ingrained... Somebody say ingrained. ingrained. Someone say ingrained. ingrained. An ingrained set of principles, procedures... Rituals and values. Say principles, principles. Procedures, procedures, rituals, and values. Principles, principles. procedures, rituals, because not all rituals are bad. Rituals and values. 
that a group of people or a person hold dear that determine their lifestyle and their expression in everyday life. For instance, where I come from, respect for elders is such a part of our culture that it permeates every aspect of life. We have one word for talking to an elder and a different word for talking to a junior. Now, you can see how... No, language is not culture. Language is an expression of culture. So the culture is... Now, notice I said principles. So the principle is respect for elders, right? Procedures, how we do things. Values, the things that are important to us, right? And rituals, the things that we do as habits. So... For instance, in my mother tongue, if I am talking to Reverend Kola, if I say, you know, if I want to say good morning or I called you yesterday, sir, I use a different word than if I'm talking to Pastor Shepherds. Same word in English. Does that make sense? So, for instance, you can tell about the culture of a person or people based on their language. Language is one of the first clues as to culture. There is one word called love in the English language. There are five translations in Greek. Who do you think values love more? There are certain words in English that don't exist in Hebrew. Because in the Hebrew culture, those concepts don't exist. Does that make sense? There's some words that don't exist in Hebrew because they never said them because they, it never happened that anybody would need to say it. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And vice versa. So say culture. Culture. Dressing is a form of culture. Okay, go, going back to respect. So not only do we have different words in my mother's language for different ages of people, there is a way you greet your friend. I know here in the, in the West, you see your friends, I mean, you, know, I mean, you, you, I mean, you meet your father-in-law to be for the first time. You're like, hello, sir. Where I come from, the man won't shake you. Be like, then you look at your girlfriend and say, and he'll walk out on you. you. Don't come into my house for the first time and say, hello, sir. You know, years ago when I met Pastor Dickett's father for the first time, you know, <laughs> he didn't know who I was. We weren't even dating at the time when I met him for the very first time. This is about a month before the Lord opened my eyes. You know, growing up like I did, when I was introduced, you know, the man's four or five inches taller than me anyway. So I did what we usually do, you know, hello, sir. So he forgot about me because I greeted him properly. He forgot about me. We had to remind him years later, you know that guy? Now, a friend of mine who was about his height, whose name I can't mention on YouTube, Walked up to him. I was like, hello, sir. You know, and began talking to him for, until tomorrow, my father-in-law hasn't forgotten that guy. <laughs> Says, that, that silly boy. Because <laughs> there's a way we do things. Does that make sense? Yeah. Say ritual. ritual. Say procedure. procedure. There are things you will not dare in my culture Ask your mom or dad to do for you. No, you won't dare. You call your sister say, can you please pick me something on the way home? You don't call your parents like that. Like I keep trying to teach many of you. Your father's room or space is holy ground. It's sacred. You approach once a year on the day of atonement. Like Esther waiting for the scepter. And you tell your brothers and sisters, please tie a rope to my leg. Because if I perish, I perish. You... But I walk into my office and people are sat down doing their homework. Okay, fine. Not bad. But then they've moved this, taken that. Moved... I mean, if I come to my office again and somebody moves my heater without my permission. Make them sort of home in my fridge. I mean, it's difficult for me to appreciate because I, I go... I mean, my pastor growing up. Pastor's office. Now, am I trying to? Pro- no, please. I want. I'm a people's guy, amen. But, but don't desecrate my personal space, amen. 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 It, just, just culture. Someone say culture, 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 culture. My dad came back home when you were growing up, 
and he met you in the house, sat down, you were dead. All the children would parade to the yard. Whether or not you were happy, we'd all line up, Daddy, welcome. Yeah. Yeah. I said, Daddy, oh, yo, yo, Daddy, that's how we said. If you went to visit, you, you, I'm just telling you how we that now. See, now some of it was, was OTT, true, over the top, but there's a principle I'm trying to teach. You go to visit your friend, you walk into their yard, and their father's car is there, you turn back. Amen. You go to see your friend there. Dad's car, mom's car is there. Oh my, hello, ma. But dad's car is there. Amen. You're playing, you know, football, and you hear the the horn at the gate. I remember there was a time where we were playing this game, man. You know, you know, we we were playing, you know, first to three or whatever, and it was two-two football. And we'd been playing for almost half an hour, nobody had scored. And then I got the ball, you know, you know, did a one to it, my friend. And I was one on one with the goalkeeper. We were like, yes, you know. And we heard my dad's car. <laughs> In the space of time, it took me to figure out do I, do we, do I, because I, I had a shot. To, do I score the goal? <laughs> By the time I thought about it and I looked back at the ball, the goalkeeper had gone. The posts. <laughs> We would use our shoes or our school bags as posts. The goalkeeper had gone. The post had gone. You understand what I'm saying? Say culture. Now, it's, culture isn't something you have to teach on a daily basis. If you constantly have to be taught something day in, day out, it hasn't yet become a culture. Now, Culture must be taught at first, but more importantly, it is not taught, it is caught. I don't have to tell Kadesh, don't say we, say yes. He ain't going to be speaking French, you know why? Nobody in that house speaks French. I was joking with a friend the other day, you know, about about the whole London thing, and and I was like, you know what, When, when you're a single man and you do things in obedience to God... It's a lot different than when you're married. And we were joking about how now that God gives me an instruction, there's so many different things I have to consider. And I said, for instance, one of the things I have to consider, I was only joking, in my geographical decisions, is what accent my son will grow up speaking. True? True? It's important, isn't it? Not. <laughs> but um, if, I, if I raise him in Manchester, he's going to have a Lancashire accent. If I raise him in Newcastle, he's going to have a Jody accent. If I raise him in Sunderland, he'll have a Mackham accent. I ain't raising him in Liverpool. <laughs> I'm just being honest. Or Birmingham. <laughs> you know? You don't have to tell a child, you don't have to teach them what accent to speak with. They will imbibe. Does that make sense? Yes. Now, in the same manner, there is a culture that is required for every destiny to be fulfilled, whether it's a personal destiny or it's a corporate destiny. Amen. Amen. It's a culture. It's a culture. And if you don't build the culture... See, okay, let me, let me take a step back. There's two ways culture can be established, on purpose or by default. You can take responsibility as a father of a house. Hear me, hear me. All the men in the house, whether or not you're married, whether or not you have children, listen to me. You are responsible under God for the culture in your home. You are mandated by God as the priest of that home to set the atmosphere. And I don't just mean spiritually. Your children, your wife will watch you. There was a day last year where, you know, I didn't realize that I'd gotten so busy that I'd gone from spending hours in prayer a day to 30 minutes, 20 minutes here and there. And then there was a day where I just, you know, took like almost the whole day. And my wife was like, yeah, I miss the days of you praying. I'm like, you've been watching me? The same woman who used to complain, you always pray. You don't have time for me. You know, what, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Say, you know, is, 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 you know, is it prayer I'll eat? You know, you know. 
when, when we were dating, you know, I would go to her house and I would just disappear in her house. And she'd catch me in a spare room praying. The first time my mother spoke to my wife was I went to visit her and she called me and she picked up the phone and said, who's this? Like, oh, are you a jockey? Oh, yes, ma. Where's the limited? Oh, he's praying, ma. That was me. And I didn't notice that it was rubbing off. So when, you know, busyness in ministry reduced it, it I, does that make sense? Yes, sir. Children pick up things. They pick up arguments, fights. They pick up laziness, slothfulness. Yep. If you eat unhealthy, don't tell your children not to buy KFC. They say, mommy, but what about you? If you go late to work every day, don't tell them to wake up early to go to school. They, you, you set the atmosphere. Amen. You set the tone. You are responsible for the culture. Like, some of you were here the other day, for instance, doing praise and worship. You saw, I told you, if your eyes were open, I told Natalia, put Kadesh down. Come on now. Put him down. But I said, put him down. First of all, you go and worship. Secondly, don't teach him. I mean, you guys have made things difficult for me now. Because you, lo- you like carrying him so much. Preach, and when he comes home, he wants to be carried 24 7. So I'm like, you sit your back, you're a human being. Amen. You have your own two legs. Oh, you want to stand yourself. You know? <laughs> Amen. Come on. Secondly, this is God's Amen. presence. Mm-hmm. You might be 11 months old. Your soul might be 11 months old. Mm. Your body might be 11 months old, but your spirit is eternal. And your spirit knows the presence of God. And from the time he was in the womb, we were singing to him and worshiping with him. So, and you see him, you know. (laughs) Worship! Don't wait till he's 11 years old with his iPod on in church. Like, Like, I see some people do. In church, doing praise and worship. You got his, I mean... The wise ones have little earphones. The stupid ones have beat audio. In church, praise and worship. I want to just lay my shoe on you. Train up a child, not an adult. And according to Jewish culture, you stop being a child when you cross from 12 to 13. At 13, you have a bar mitzvah. So in God's mind, train up a child means age 0 to 12. Anything you haven't trained, it's in God's hands now. Yep. It's in God's hands now. That's past 13, whatever foundations you haven't laid past 13, you, 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 need, you need a miracle. Say culture. Some of, I mean, I, I told some of you how when I was a child... My mate would be playing football. My mom would sit me down at that table. You finish your homework. And then, mom, boom. You know, some of our parents would have gone to jail for some of the things they did to us in those days. But look how we turned out. I was forced to learn discipline, responsibility, delayed gratification. Mommy, I don't like that food. Finish it. I don't like it. Fine. Give it to me. She'd cover it for you with nice cling film. Put it, at, well, I don't know if they had cling film in those days, but she'd cover it with something. I think it was foil, whatever it was. she put it back in the fridge for you. Your next meal, when everybody else was eating, she'd bring out the old food and warm it up and give it back to you. And, and, and after, when that night came, she put it in the freezer to make sure it didn't spoil. No matter how long it took you, you would finish that food. And I'll teach you. Okay, so I'm get you something else. And then the child grows up. I don't like that wife. Okay, let me get you another one. It's the same principle, isn't it? It's a culture. Culture. There's some places in the world till today when you go to the market, people don't stay with their wares. They put a little note saying how much each thing is. Till today. You get there. You pick something, you put the money there. And they know nothing will be missing. If anything is ever stolen, they come after the newest person to join the village. Because we were not stealing till you arrived. Amen. It's not our culture mm. to steal. Mm. Mm. Amen. 
And culture is a powerful thing. It's a spiritual thing. It begins to permeate the atmosphere. Please help me, Pastor Paul. For instance, you get a church where three, four, five people start praying for real. All the better if one of them is the senior pastor. You know, it's not necessary, but it helps. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And all of a sudden, everybody starts praying. You get a church where everybody's, or oh, three or four or five people start asking everybody every service, how was your week? And all of a sudden, everybody starts asking, how was your week? You get three or four or five people start gossiping. And if you are not careful, before you know it, almost everybody will start. Because both God and Satan understand that certain seeds only grow in certain climates. So child of God, Christian, church worker, pastor, minister, ask yourself personally, and then in whatever group I am responsible for, what is the harvest we want? Then observe your culture and ask yourself, will this culture give birth to that harvest? If the answer is yes, increase your effort. If the answer is no, no matter how much effort you put in, you'll be wasting your time. So you ask yourself a question. Are you prepared to accept whatever result your current culture will bring? Or are you prepared to do what it takes to change the culture? And this is where many of us fail. Because it takes effort to change a culture. I'll give you an example. Boxers have a culture. When they're preparing for a fight, there's certain things they can't eat. There's certain things they can't drink. They have to jog a certain number of miles a day. And that's why the older sportsmen get, or women get, you get to an age where they start to, their performance declines sharply. It's not just age. Because from 32 to 33, those 12 months didn't age you by 10 years. But the older you get, the more difficult it is to wake up at the same time and do the same thing. It gets boring. It gets repetitive. That's why many of them retire. So you can have a Ryan Geeks playing at 40 and some people retire at 31 because most of the other people can't handle the culture it takes to stay at the top. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you get me? Do you get me? There's a certain lifestyle you need to be a successful singer. You can't eat crackers every day. Amen. There's a certain lifestyle you require to be a first class student in university. Who knows what I'm talking about? There's a certain lifestyle you require to be a successful 21st century mother. Amen. You go to work, you, you have to balance career, children, ministry. You, many women, see, many of you young people, you young ladies, I just, I look at you and I just shake my head. And I'm sure the older ladies know what I'm talking about, right? You look, we look at you and we're like, you know what? You better fix up quick, fast, and in a hurry. You know, you break your ten. You want to wash plates, you slap your gloves on. Are you crazy? Gloves from where? Selfie gloves to wash one plate. You got one baby on your back, one in your arm. You're cooking gloves. The same way you young guys, we look at you and we just scratch our heads. No response, no sense of response whatsoever. You wake up at 12 o'clock and you roll over straight to the breakfast table. You don't get anywhere on time. Can't be, can't be tr- oh, I said I wasn't going to attack anybody today. Let me just chill. The reason why we're shouting at you is not because you're so horrible, but we look at your culture and the future you say you want and we realize they are mutually exclusive. Mutually exclusive. Hello. Uh, this is a joke, but there's it, it a point behind it. 
my housemaster in university, God bless his soul, you know, but he's alive. I mean, God bless him. He's alive, you know. Uh, you know, his name is Mr. Lashimbo. We used to fight. Ooh, we used to, I mean, this man and I used to, we used to, ooh, hammer and tongs, you know. He's called me Isi Awe. That's what he called me. My son named Isi Awe. You're a bad boy. So I'm like, sir, I'm only one. He says, shut up. You think you're intelligent? I'm like, um, no. He's like, I see you talking to the guests. I'm like, sir, I'm just uh, sharing the gospel. I was. But he used to come to our, our hostel every six o'clock in the morning with a cane. And he tiptoe in. And he would go to the bed of the most senior student to start from there. Get up! Lazy boys! I was like, for crying out loud, why are you hitting me with a bell? It's 6 a.m. in the morning. Until I became a man. And one day I found myself at 6 a.m. in the morning with my tie, my trousers, my belt, and my shine shoes driving on the M1 from Sheffield to Leeds to start work. 6 a.m. in the morning. I remember the king. Ah, now I understand what he was doing. He would say, any of you, if you wake up in the morning and the first thing you think about is a woman, it can't be better for you. Now, if you're married, it's fine. As long as there's a woman beside you. But you get the point. Some people have failed exams because of a girl. Because you can't control your emotions. You can't, I mean, you have an exam tomorrow, you're on the phone till 3 a.m. in the morning talking to someone you will not be with in six months. Spend your student loan, all of it buying credit. Let's say with the Zimbabwean, buying credit. Say with the Shona accent, buying credit. Apana sense. Apana, apana wisdom. Can't control your emotions. Culture of lasciv. I mean, excess. Can't wait. At sixteen, you want to drink. This is for those who are not even saved now. I mean, I don't subscribe to drink, period. Forge a driving license at 15. So you, you can't wait for anything. And then by the time you are 17 and old enough to get your license, you start your license with seven point with nine points. Sorry. Hello. Who knows what I'm talking about? You 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 you, you your brand new license comes with six points on it. The same in the house of God. Irresponsibility, indiscipline, selfishness. You yourself. I, I, I keep telling some of you, the world doesn't rise and set on your backside. The Lord's prayer begins, "Our Father." The first line, the first word says, "Our." Your dad has all the children. Act like it. Think like it. Talk like it. Behave. Stop thinking. Me, 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 me. Part of the principle of tithing is to teach you that your money doesn't end with you alone. It's a culture. And, and that culture determines how rich you'll be. Again, I heard Bishop Wedekwa once say, that, you know, he and his wife lived beside someone for many years. And one day he told his wife, have you ever seen anybody coming out of that house other than the people that live there? So what do you mean? So for almost 20 years, they never had a guest one day. And he put it this way, they ate all their food, they drank all their water. 20 years later, things were too tight for them. Spend all your resources on you. You, you are the center of your world. Can't go out of your way to help anybody. So some of you, some of you, I'm not talking about you. I'm just giving a general point. But I've, I've scolded some of you about this before. Somebody walks in the church with a rotten week. And all they need is a hug. 
So I want to talk to them, but all you care about is you. You came to church, you've had a bad day, you're not happy, so. Hmm. If you have a car, someone asks you for a lift, I'm in a rush to get to where I'm going. Maybe the person didn't eat that morning, who knows? Maybe they came to church hungry. Maybe they spent their last penny to get there. I'm in a rush, sorry, bye-bye. Then you see them next week, go, how are you doing? How do you think they're doing? How do you think they're doing? Talk to me, talk to me, talk to me. Finally, worship, prayer, passion, zeal is a culture. It's a culture. It's a culture, it's a culture, it's a culture. culture. Lifting hands in worship is a culture. Shouting is a culture. Wanting to be in God's presence is a culture. And all these things are requisite for revival. You go through the New Testament. For instance, the Bible says how good, how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the oil that flows. If you want God to move, there has to be a culture of unity. If you want to see the miraculous, there must be a culture of expectancy. You don't come to church looking like three miles of burnt toast. You come expectant. God could talk to me today. God could speak. I mean, you know, you come passionate for God to move. Don't leave it to the poor worship leader. You when your favorite song comes. So it's a culture. So I'm going to close with this. I'm going to close with this. I've got 15 minutes, but I'll close here right now. And I am closing, I promise. What culture do you as a person and this house as a church, what three things can you adjust about your personal culture and our corporate culture to fulfill your personal assignment and our corporate assignment this year? Repeat myself. What three things, someone say three. Usually culture changes don't need to be very, very drastic. Are you with me? Are you aware that the sitting arrangement right now is the culture? We started like this. And we went that way where a few people at the front and someone can be at the back. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I started noticing some things I didn't like. So the fact that the preacher can stare everybody in the eyeball from all across the room right now is a culture. When you go to a, to a live group meeting or, or captivating meeting, the fact that everybody sat down in a semicircle is a culture. The fact that there are no reserved seats for the mini stars is a culture. Culture changes don't need to be pronounced to be effective. They just need to be consistently followed. I will wake up at 7 a.m. every morning and pray for an hour as a culture change. You don't need to tell anybody about it. Just do it. And science teaches us it takes 21 days minimum to form a habit. Every Sunday after church, I will go to three people and ask them how their week went. Culture change. I will not hug the heaters when I'm in service culture change so that so so the heat can move around the room so everybody can be hot not a few people with the heater by their legs absorbing all the heat somebody say culture change i will increase my giving by five percent every month culture change and you will notice that your income will increase by a lot more than five percent and you don't need to announce to everybody what you gave you just realize that when it starts I'm, I'm not, it's very interesting I notice every time every time the pastor of a church imbibes something and leadership do watch what happens I can I can go through a church's financial calendar and compare it with the pastor's financial calendar and they'll match you don't need to say, oh, I gave a thousand pounds today. No, just give it. That's why we've said it before. If you're a leader and you don't tithe, please let us know. 
you're on Aiken, let's stone you. If you're a leader and you don't tithe, please, can you remember, remember we said that at the meeting, right? Kindly lift, let's know who you are. You either will start tithing or kindly step down because we don't want you to bring a curse upon us. Does that make sense? Because then we're going to introduce the devourer into the system and then into the personal lives of the poor people we lead. Jesus said, I sanctify myself on their or for their sake. If a leader starts becoming perverse, watch what happens. Someone say shift. Stand with me tonight. Stand with me. Say shift. Say shift. What do you need to change? about your personal culture. Pastor Shepherds, next workers meeting or whatever it is, open floor question. What do we need? Life group leaders, same thing. Everybody go back to your individual. Whoever is in charge of anything, heads of departments, whatever, ask your people. What do, what three things can we change about the choir this year? that will shift our results. Media team, what three things can we change? Life group leaders, what three things can we change? Welcome team, what three things can we change? Someone say three. It's all it takes, three. What will I shift about my culture that will change? Because culture determines what you attract. Are you with me? The people who want to live in America, Growing up, all I ever wanted to do was go to America. I didn't like the UK, I'm being honest. I thought the UK was boring. In America, you know, all the gangsters, you know, with their, you know. So, you know, as a teenager, I thought, man, you know, I want to be, you know. You know what I mean? Now, I'm not that, I can actually be cool. I'm just trying to be, I'm pretending to be older than I actually am. People choose certain countries to emigrate to because of their culture. True true there's countries in the world i don't want to raise my children in but their culture i know many african parents who say i want to take my child back to africa for a year or two so they can learn something right true so i say culture why should anybody want to help you why should anybody want to be your friend why should anybody want to marry you what is it about your personal culture that will attract the dream spouse you've been fasting for. And corporately, why should anybody want to join your church? Why should anybody want to accept the God you portray to them? What is it about your personal culture? What is it about our culture as a house that will attract the harvest God has been promising us? Lift up your voice and pray with me for two or three minutes. See, Lord, this year, open my eyes to see strengthen my hands to adjust give me grace and wisdom to see through every cultural change that I need as a person that we need as a house to implement come on pray 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 the heavens are open the glory is here now we can draw near no longer to fear God has promised he has spoken this is the year of ascension he has released word after word prophecy after prophecy promise after promise impartation after impartation now he is waiting for us as a people privately and corporately to make certain adjustments We say, God, we want the widow and the orphan. If you send them to us, will our culture cater for them? Are we so judgmental? Why would God want to send someone who used to be a prostitute into a church where he knows they'll be condemned or at least made to feel like they're condemned? I'm not saying that, I'm just giving an example. Why would he send a drug dealer?
what's our culture what's our way of doing things how do we think how do we process for me it says when many of us see hard work our first thought is how can I dodge this when we see a challenge our first thinking is too much hard or too much work for me when we see someone who's messed up whose character is tore from the floor up do we say hey potential disciple or do we say God this person is so horrible keep them away from me What's our attitude to prayer? What's our attitude to evangelism? Any church that says it wants to grow, who doesn't want to evangelize, is wasting its time, or just simply wants to build an empire. Any minister who wants to walk in the anointing, who doesn't want to fast and pray, is asking to be a wizard. God resists the proud he gives grace to the humble if you want grace you gotta be humble I could go on and on and on and on and on but every next level in God is on the other side of a hard adjustment it's on the other side of a cultural shift on the other side of a change of modus operandi Come on, somebody, say, God, open my eyes, open our eyes, oh Lord. Show us, oh Lord. Show us, oh Lord. Take the keyboard up. Even when we pray the prayers and we sing the song, show us your glory. Why does God show us his glory? Part of God's glory is his culture. The glory, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3:18 is released to transform us into its own image. Glory is a culture. Glory is a principle. It's a ritual. It's a value system. It's a procedure. There's a way God does things and the more time you spend with Him in His presence, it should begin to adjust you on the inside. Make you change the way you approach stuff. Oh, yeah. And finally in the words of William McDowell the change I want to see must first begin in me I surrender so your world can be changed I must first portray the culture that I want to see around me the change I want to see must first begin in me as a house as we approach for what changes do we want to see excellence love community growth blessing yes revival all these changes must start in us as individuals we must go home to the haunt of our altars and say, Lord, make me a person of excellence. Make me a person of prayer. Make me a person of revival. Make me a person of awakening. Come on, somebody. Give me a heart of love and unity. Make me a person who cares for the feelings of others. The change I want to see must first begin in me. I surrender so your world can be changed. The change I want to see must first begin in me. I surrender so your world can be changed. The 
change I want to see must first begin in me. I surrender so your world can be changed. The change I want to see must first begin in me. I surrender so your world can be changed. The change I want to see must first begin in me. I surrender so your world can be changed. The change I want to see must first begin in me. Yeah, I surrender so your I want to see must first begin in me. Yeah. I surrender. Finally. There's three cultures or three aspects to culture that every house of God must imbibe corporately if it wants to fulfill its destiny. There are others that are specific, but there's three general aspects of culture, every church, every ministry. Number one is love. Someone say love. Say unity. Say community. The Bible says they will know we are Christians by our love. The authenticity of our faith that we love one another the Bible says the first commandment is love the Lord your God the second is like the first meaning it's as important as the first love your neighbor as yourself stop being an island stop being selfish stop thinking about only you stop praying about only you stop spending your money on only you stop worrying about only your problems stop stop making everything about me second culture must be one of pursuit of God call it revival call it pursuit call it intimacy call it desperation call it prayer call it fasting it's the same thing there must be a culture of chasing after God not of making God a pocket calculator or gene in a bottle but a culture that reaches for more of him his power his presence his love his will in praying in fasting in study of the word in 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 in, in corporate prayer amen the third thing the third thing don't say the third thing must be one of outreach church is the only organization that was established for people who are not part of it most churches stagnate when they start turning inwards as opposed to outwards. Somebody once said, oh, it's manipulative. I don't care. Call me. It's fine. I'm, mani- I'm manipulating you. Amen. Okay, let's put this on record. Yes, I agree with the truth. If you have no burden for evangelism, you're selfish. If, if, if you can live life happy to pray to a God someone introduced you to without the burden to introduce someone else to him you are selfish you are I can go off and say you are wicked wicked I'm not talking now about I mean it's good for churches to have corporate evangelism like we do no but fine I'm not saying you it has to be all corporate but what in your personal life are you doing to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth who are you reaching out to who are you stretching out the gospel to who are you trying to release the flavor of God to who are you inviting to come and enjoy the same relationship with God as you do in their personal life if, if, if your church is so beautiful to you who are you inviting to, to I mean you know think about it Someone say love. 
say pursuit say outreach everything else will find its place put up your right hand say Lord this year make us a people of love people of pursuit people of outreach say love outreach pursuit say L-O-P love outreach pursuit love outreach pursuit love outreach pursuit say God we will love we will be known as the love church we will be known as the evangelism outreach church we will be known as the church of pursuit we will fulfill our destiny we will give you praise by our lives in the precious name of Jesus. Somebody put your hands together for God.